Okay, and uh, cheers. 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 And welcome at the first issue of International Open Podcast. Um, we are here today. I'm your host. I'm your host, Horst. <laughs> Hello, I'm Stefan. Hello, I'm Dennis. Hello, I'm Derek. And you can find more about this podcast about the homepage of internationalopenmagazine.org. What are the topics of today? Uh, the topics of today are... I'll bring in some uh, um, explanations of what the Vienna Hackathon was. It was a, a refugee hackathon that happened two weeks ago here in Vienna. I will and I will talk about some of the talks that happened at Euroku 2015 that happened just a few days ago at Salzburg. Um, for example, one talk about the Sonic Pi, which is a, a music library for um, Raspberry Pis written in Ruby, and the gaming uh, library called Gosu, and another talk that was about how to cut any polygon by just one cut if you have one piece of paper and scissors. So this might sound a bit strange, but you will get the details later on. I will talk about the human resource machine. <laughs> it's a game. It's a game, yes. Okay. It's like Scratch, no, uh, but it's a game. I'll be joining in a conversation with Horst about our incredible road trip to Maker Fair Roma. Yeah, we were traveling from Vienna to Rome for this event. Yeah. And I may add some little uh, observations about teaching Makey Makey with Makey Makey and um, some other. Yes, and setting up Ubuntu Mate on a Raspberry Pi. Hmm. Okay, let's start. Um, Stefan. You comfortable starting? Okay, sure. Stefan, uh, you were on the refugee hack hackathon, and I was already hearing you were covered in the Austrian radio. Right? That's that's correct. We have been on digital living. That would be the translation. Okay. German, it was digital leben. That was uh, quite interesting as well, because suddenly there were people arriving from Austrian radio, which we were not expecting to come up, to show up. But more about the Refugee Hackathon, it happened uh, two weeks ago, was located at two of the Viennese co-working spaces. One was Sector 5 and the second one is called Stockwerk. They were friendly enough or kindly enough to um, um, offer us the rooms for the programming session. And so it was private organized in Vienna by... Uh, it, yes, absolutely. It was um, not a state or city founded. No, it was absolutely organized by enthusiasts. You can still find everything online, uh, even on an English page, if I remember correctly. This is the URL for this is hackathon.wien. And um, these were the, the starting informations. And on Friday, um, seven projects were introduced, which had either already been started by uh, enthusiasts or were just in the phase of getting started. And we founded groups to start with these projects. And in the beginning, I was very interested to join a project about opening data, which is more or less... Um, it is public in the sense that you can get to it, but it's not in a very useful format. For example, it's, it's hidden. It's an open data uh, it's, thing. Yes, it's an open data thing. It's uh, data which is hidden in PDFs, and the target was to get it online in the sense that you can either Machine access reading. either access it um, by machines if it's uh, exported to CSV files, or even better in in a, in a web interface, so you can easily access it access it without any programming knowledge. And I was very interested into that program and I thought I could contribute there, but there were so many people at that project already, so I thought it would be maybe more interesting to go to a project where nobody uh, was. Can I, can I just ask, you yeah. was not coming there with an already half-made uh, pet project or an idea in your head? You're no, just coming there uh, absolutely. You said, I have skills, I'm a geek, I want yes, to that's right. for refugees. Yeah, yeah. And also the programmers were not supposed to come with new projects because mm -hmm. there were seven, let's call them, d domain experts mm -hmm. who came up with 
uh, projects or with ideas for projects because they already uh, were in contact or were even part of NGOs. So they actually needed what is the need. Mm -hmm. So, and I joined a different project, which um, I would like to uh, talk, uh, tell you also about a little bit, which is called Where to Help. You can also find that uh, already online. It's where to help.at, the, the URL for that one. And uh, the target of that project is to bring together NGOs and their requirements and volunteers and um, because volunteers are searching, they, they can offer okay. their yeah can offer their skills can offer the mm -hmm. times and it happened that for example ngos posted something on facebook or on twitter and we need 20 people for mm -hmm. example just helping with simple tasks 40 people showed up and they couldn't make any use of them because they couldn't organize them sent 20 of them home the other 20 helped Which but on the bad feeling for first yeah. created bad immediate fe reactions but on the next day they needed let's say another 21 mm -hmm. so the first 20 couldn't help again because they had to be yeah. engaged with a job and the other 20 were frustrated from the day before and they said maybe if I come back again mm -hmm. that will be sent for the second time and that's no fun at all. So we would like to, to have this in a more organized way and also cross NGO if you like. So, so not only... Like some some uh, job, uh, volunteer job uh, skill matchmaking uh, Right, exactly. Software. That's that's mm -hmm. it in one, in one sentence and that's what we started working on. So... Uh, and, and this will be open source, I suppose. Absolutely, not only open source, but also free software, of course. It is already. <laughs> <laughs> you beat me. You, we, you. <laughs> we, we haven't decided on the on the actual license up to now, but mm. it's already on GitHub. So you could uh, look in the refugee hack uh, um, um, area of mm. GitHub and find the project there, yeah. and it will soon be not only available in source code form but also in production, so that mm. the actual NGOs can use it. And that's what we're currently working on. We have been working for two days there. And it was sort of a contest. It was put in a contest, and I'm quite proud. I, I pat me on my on my shoulder that we made the first prize there, um, because there was a, com a contest. Yes, there were contests within that. So the seven, so the seven projects were competing each, and each other, and we were the winning team, and that was wow. great fun because we really started at zero. We just started with the idea of one, and that's also interesting. Yeah. One Luxembourg guy, mm -hmm. he's called Roger and the interesting part was he could talk to all the Austrian NGOs quite well because German, uh, yes uh, he speaks fluently German but not only that he is not an Austrian person so he isn't engaged in a single NGO which could make the other NGOs jealous or something like that mm -hmm. so he was in sort of a neutral position and could bring several NGOs to one table and talk to each other and that's where he picked up that idea I was mm -hmm. talking about, about that match matchmaking thing, thing. And then he presented it to us and we formed um, two people were doing project management, um, two people were doing the backend for the application. Uh, I was one of these two. Two people were doing front end, a web front end. Two more people were doing an Android client, so this can also uh, then be used as an Android application. And that was the maybe the most funnest thing on the last day. One of the organizers was a bit bored because everything was working fine. <laughs> they did so great preparation there was that nothing to organize, no, nothing to organize <laughs> any, and everything was was running as ex maybe better even than expected. And so he was a bit bored and he joined in because that was a developer on his own and he started developing an iOS application. So, and we could show, uh, show screenshots at the end and this impressed uh, the, the jury and they said that could be really something useful and something, um, something easy to use for the people. And what was even more nice is that the project did not stop with the final day, but now a bit more than a week has passed and all of the people who originally were engaged in the project are still engaged. Wow. We have, I think, more than 30 uh, 
um, further revisions of the software already. We have a next meetup next week and we have other things planned as well. So I hope to be able to uh, report on that project in future that we have made success and not only a working demo or something like that, but actually the software used by actual NGOs and volunteers. From the glow in your eyes, I get that you also like that socially. Also, so right, that you absolutely. Get, uh, new friendships or at least good people. To absolutely. Connect. It was First of all, uh, it, it, it was great fun to see uh, that it's possible within two hours to get something working, to get an organi a mini organization working. People were collaborating even if they were from different countries. One guy is uh, joining in from Croatia. We have an American guy. Um, we have one from Luxembourg, as I said before, who is more or less project owner or the... the, the requester for the for the different items mm -hmm. we have a german guy we have uh, several austrian people inside the team so it's great fun to work in that group just let me clarify the people mostly did not know each other beforehand right. so they right. come just they are willing to help yeah. with their skills yeah and now the i cannot resist whipping the corporate world here uh you had no uh, middle management and top management and complicated scoop rule master uh, to, to give someone task and ask if they are done and uh, if he can maybe motivate you to do them faster yes we had them you had them i, I have to d disappoint uh, you uh, because uh, we've we've corporate world creeps into the no, absolutely not. That has nothing to do with corporate world. Organization is also useful in an open source mm -hmm. uh, project. So two people decided to run the project management mm -hmm. and, and they were sort of shielding us from the lots of requests that were, uh, that were coming from the people with the ideas. Mm -hmm. So because in two days you can so only achieve so idea, many things. Idea Absol <laughs> ab absolutely. <laughs> Our task is to get an MVP, as it's called, uh, running. That means a minimal viable product, mm -hmm. so something small that can actually mm -hmm. be tested and can be proven that it's of use. And we can still later on improve that one to get more features in or uh, different stuff to change that. So in this, uh, this uh, project man management skill were useful. So absolutely. Were not, um, absolutely. Forced upon a group who would no, no. And, and, and a nice agile uh, project management can still be useful mm -hmm. or is even necessary. And uh, the people are still uh, in the project and help us and, and work with our, uh, as us. It's also good to have uh, different eyes on the project, which are maybe not so technical mm -hmm. as we, the developers, are. So yes, we are yeah, still going on. What was the uh, work group language? So you had uh, people from all countries? Uh, yeah, so the language was English, of course. Was in English, yeah. okay, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, congratulations, Stefan. Yeah. You sound very good. You sound very happy, very close. Yeah, it's great side. fun. Yes. Yeah. Like you found something very cool to have. You think this is uh, this whole uh, setup of uh, going together to a refugee hackathon to solve uh, urgent social uh, needs um, uh, is uh, doable in every city where, where skilled people are? Of course, not only in every city, but also with different topics. So mm -hmm. this was not the first hackathon that has been organized by that team. For example, they did a food hackathon because there's so much food waste going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a hackathon uh, uh, organized earlier that year where I didn't join, so I don't know the details about that one. And they plan to do further ones as well. So, um, so um, what what is absolutely ne minimum needed to do a hack hackathon that all sound like for me now like in the Marvel comics that some people with superpowers uh, go together <laughs> via uh, funny pajamas and, and, and fight the evils um, what you need you need a room and, and an idea and a website if you were in a city without hackathons what, what would be the Good minimum necessary to good question. Up. I was thinking if this could be done remotely. I'm not so sure. So I think a room and meeting is a good idea. So you prof profited from the physical interaction. Yes, I would say so. Way. Especially when the people don't know each other in mm. beforehand. It's easier because yeah. you have eye contact and you can talk to each other quite quickly. Um, it, I would say it depends maybe even more on the social skills than the technical skills because it there is no immediate need that there comes something technically out of a hackathon. Uh, hack in the original sense doesn't mean a program. It means a clever solution to a 
problem. So there could be completely different ways of solutions coming out of something like that. And so different, maybe I uh, would like to put it the other way around, try uh, to get as many enthusiastic people about the topic as possible, then see what skills they actually have. And then out of that one, decide what find you can problem for the skills. <laughs> find a problem that you can lose with uh, use with the skills, uh, so, solve with the skills. So if I get you right, uh, that, uh, this was held in a uh, co-working space. Right. They had rooms with uh, internet connection and yeah. electricity, but you all brought your own computers. That's right. We were actually working in two co-working spaces, yeah. so just to get more room, mm -hmm. and uh, we formed groups so uh, to to work on on uh, smaller uh, in smaller groups because mm -hmm. uh, I think it was more than forty people who were involved and building a team of 40 people within such short time is probably not feasible mm -hmm. so it's easier to have smaller projects uh, smaller teams we were even not sure if we would make it out with our nine people but finally that worked out we were a bit uh, surprised that it worked out well because we were not so sure if that group isn't too big were there some kind of uh, personal management and headhunting going on between the projects like we yes. need a web guy uh, we steal him from the yes team? That was in the on the first day in the evening, but I'm not sure if this went too well. It was, I would say, it was a lot of good luck that mm -hmm. this team found each other. But also, when I saw the results on the final day, there were presentations before, so that the jury could decide mm -hmm. who was the winning team. And I saw, I think, five presentations, and from four of them, I was really impressed. So there are lots four of stuff. Or five boots, yeah. Yeah. So, so that was just needing more time. Or? Yeah, there was lots of good stuff come out. At least lots of interesting, uh, promising stuff coming out. Just to give you maybe one more example. No, 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 no. One project was um, refugees um, arrive at a certain area, and then maybe they don't really know each other, but they have common problems. So, um, the idea is was to build a messaging application. Most of them have uh, smartphone uh, phones with them. Uh, lots of them don't have working SIM cards, mm -hmm. so they depend on Wi-Fi. So it should be something that is capable of using Wi-Fi. But then to have a messaging application that is just reaching um, to a certain area. So let's say I'm interested to talking to people which are 10 kilometers around mm -hmm. me because that's more or less within my walking distance. So we could collaborate uh, with each other, share expectations, share opportunities, all that stuff. Also to help people to communicate which are in a, in a, search, a certain reason, a region. Um, if, you, if you put it to, to, to uh, the situation that's uh, currently right now in Vienna, it could be useful to restrict that area even more. Let's say just uh, take 500 meters yeah, area around me. And yeah, ex exactly. People are forming around the, the train stations. People are grouping around the houses which... Yeah. Um, host them for the for the time, and so they maybe it's also possible then to find each other or find people who have uh, same interests or same capabilities because there are always tasks to manage for them, mm -hmm. and it's always good. Also, the other way around, it's always good to have something to do because then you can continue living and not sitting around and being depressed. Mm -hmm. Were there any were there any skills that were missing? <clears throat> were there <laughs> some people that you wished had come to? To bring other skills. I, I think we were so busy that we were not, were not thinking about <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. So that's the first time I'm thinking about yeah. that. And I'm not in, in my team. I was not missing anybody. It was working out All quite right. nicely. And uh, when we sometimes we had to look up uh, stuff, of course. But uh, the internet is available for all of us. So. And uh, still in future times when we need certain experts on, on, on certain topics, then we are trying to find them. We are as a big city with lots of people, lots of experts. You just have to find them when you need them. About the motivation, uh, you don't get paid for that? Nope. Uh, was there at least uh, some free food or some some um, yes there was some fame so you know that you would be famous if you win the become top project or was there some money a trophy to to get no no uh, we actually won something was there free beer at least <laughs> there was there was free drinks <laughs> there was even free beer but we drink, didn't drink too much because <laughs> we had to work <laughs> coding drunk is maybe not yeah. the best idea mm -hmm. um, um, there was also a prize which is also quite interesting because because it's uh, breakfast at the hotel and the total is very uh, very 
special one because it's run by former refugees only. Oh, wow. So the name of this I don't know it by heart, but we can look it up and put okay, it in the okay. show notes. It's in the second district of Vienna. I know that. Um, and there are 30 former refugees who mm -hmm. running oh, that okay. hotel. Cool. And I also knew that um, from a former story where I knew from uh, people from the Netherlands who were living or who were um, guests at that hotel and they were very happy, very, very happy to be there. They said it was absolutely, absolutely professionally um, um, yep. there and that uh, they ju could just recommend it to go there. Mm -hmm. be not only because of the idea, but also of the quality, how the service were provided. Very cool, cool. So that's an, a nice aspect as well. The yeah, price yeah. has a connection to refugees as well. Did you had any mechanism uh, or did you know about some groups uh, who had some unfitting person, like uh, someone who only say he can do something but was not actually having the skill or being awkward uh, socially so and uh, destroying no. a group with uh, his demands or something? Had your mechanism of... of um, Kicking out such persons, no, or whether no. some personal management needs. No, no, no. So only, only good uh, social uh, compatible person showed up. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the kind of people who show up at something like this because you know you will be working hard for two days you or for no three days. days so you I'm won't get paid. A, a good filter for. <laughs> and you you don't know whom you're going to work with, so yeah. your expectations are that you have to start at least a little bit more maybe defense mm. than mm. you would in your daily work life mm. or something like that. But it was. So the male egos were kept that way. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, Still, there were lots, lots more male developers than yeah. female ones, so the the, the uh, ratio was as um, the usual one, which is not so nice to see, mm -hmm. but it is that way. Uh, but it was it was fine, yeah. And there was a, a few um, uh, ad hoc projects starting as well there, so it was also cool. seen very nice. So it was like an incubator for projects. Yeah, also. yeah. For example, one guy who was. He's developing his own web application framework on top of another framework and they need a demo application. And so usually you write the boring stuff like a blog or like a to-do application. And he decided that's not the way to go. He wants to do something useful as well. So he picked up some ideas from another project owner who couldn't um, uh, get all of his, uh, all of her ideas. It was a lady actually all of her ideas uh, fulfilled though so they started the project on their own and i'm hearing that this project is making progress uh, also mm. so there's also an australian guy now involved to that project which sounds fun as well so nationalities absolutely doesn't matter in participating in such a project i'm very impressed with from this congratulations to going there and i hope the next time i can somehow be helpful and join was great fun and I will report on the, on the progress of the project. If I, if I get it right, if you have no refugee hack uh, in your city but you think there's a need for it or to solve another social problem, all you need is some space and some advertisement on, on Meetup or some other platforms that yeah. get read. Maybe that, that web internet and food and yes. electricity. Yeah. Maybe that, that yeah. website at hackathon.wien could mm. be used even also as an example. Could a template for other cities. As a template in, in, in both ways, in the technical uh, way, because it's on GitHub mm. as well, so you can just clone it and go from there. But also, but also content-wise, look what it's uh, needed. Content, yeah, yeah. And uh, maybe in a third way even, because the people who organized are very approachable, so you could talk to them mm. and ask them, um, uh, sharing uh, with their so experiences. We will put links uh, into not yet existing uh, show notes of this uh, not yet really existing podcast because it's our first issue, but you will find them all under the website uh, internationalopenmagazine.org. Look for a podcast issue one and then we will link from there. Sure. Um, one last question to this topic. Uh, were there actual refugees uh, participating? Yes, uh, there former were. Re uh, former refugees who settled in Vienna? There were actual refugees there. Mm -hmm. I think I met two of them. They were not so much uh, participating in the programming, but they were putting up uh, in the issues they have, and mm -hmm. so their needs were included in projects mm -hmm. that, that happened. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks, Stefan. You're welcome. Um, just um, to in, uh, short uh, 
change of topic. I forgot to mention uh, this uh, podcast is recorded at the, I think, 20th October 2015. Uh, we are sitting here in Vienna in the restaurant Zypresse, Westbahnstraße 35A in Vienna's 7th District. It's a Kurdish restaurant that we also can recommend because we like the owner. And yeah, we cannot say you where and when the next podcast will be because this is the first issue, but look at internationalopenmagazine.org and there you will find, uh, find hints. Okay, another topic, Dennis. Dennis, you had a very interesting topic uh, written yeah. on the list. You wrote a human resource machine. Yes. What's that? Uh, that's a game. It's ah. a game um, like um, the programming language uh, Scratch. Wow. Um, it's, but it's really a game. So it has a story. I don't know which story, but I know mm -hmm. it has a story. Um, you are a human employee at an enterprise um, uh, unternehmen. Uh, enterprise, yeah. Enter oh, so. <laughs> enterprise. Enterprise. It's playing on earth. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Tomorrow Corporation named. Ah, okay. Yes, yeah, so like the uh, developer they named um, uh, Tomorrow Corporation too. Uh, you can know them. Um, they uh, programmed um, World of Goo and. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they are, as I know from Peter Hoffer podcast, they're one of your favorite uh, yeah. game, game producers. Yes, okay. um, the it's a closed source game. It's no open source game. No, it's closed source. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the game is um, really funny. It has humor. Uh, um, it has a nice uh, graphical style, like World of Goo and um, mm -hmm. the other game. That you will like look up in the show notes. Yeah. Remember <laughs> too. Uh, yeah. It's the puppet. And you actually played the game or you just no, watched not uh, yet. demos? No, not yet. I uh, looked for the game. I know, um, I knew that the game will um, uh, released last week. Ah, okay. And so I searched for, for the game, but um, I can't pay for it. So I have to um, get some bitcoins for it. Ah, okay. But That's now I have bitcoins. Because you will buy it over Steam? Or? Um, Over humble bundle. Over humble bundle. Yeah, Put if you if you go to the mm -hmm. homepage of uh, Tomorrow Corporation, mm -hmm. you can buy it on his mm -hmm. homepage, mm -hmm. and it's a um, a, a little plug-in mm -hmm. from humble bundle. You uh, pay it. Um, a Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin uh, payment provider. Yeah, paid one, of, also one of one of a few, mm -hmm. and uh, the game is has the graphical style like World of Goo, and you have to um program the um to humans? do hum uh, one human ah. you are the employee who has to do um the to do's of the uh, vorgesetzten uh, 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 employer yeah. supervisor yeah. yes supervisors so this is actually if you ever wondered why in corporations all the employees look like remote controlled uh, robots <laughs> this is because <laughs> someone like playing this game does yeah. that he make to do lists and tasks for them yeah and you play such a guy yeah and uh, you um, you have to program uh, some steps um, there are simple steps there's an input mm -hmm. um, band and band is that right like in a factory uh, uh, yeah uh, and band yeah. yeah okay yeah uh, an input band and an output band mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and some star uh, like yeah, yeah. like um, CPU registers ah. and uh, On the uh, input band, you have symbols like um, numbers and um, some uh, letters, and you can um, program uh, took something from the input and uh, take them on the output, or uh, copy to the registers in the middle. It's like uh, like very basic uh, Turing machine programming. Yeah, it's yeah. really uh, easy. So, so you like that. Uh Yeah, and to, you have um, at the first step you have only input and output. Mm -hmm. uh, later you have uh, um, uh, add and sub and. So um, you can um, 
make operations with the numbers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have um, compute actually in the registers. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You have yeah. something in your yeah. hand Combat and um, add something um, from the registers to your symbol in your hand. Mm -hmm. And later you can put it on um, the output. You have, um, of course, jump. Jump if not zero. Jump if not uh, if. Um, Sorry, jump if sorry uh, as zero and jump if negative. So we have uh, conditions, uh, conditional condition yeah. you can do mm -hmm. some or come. Of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you can program um, like in Turing machine. You have um, uh, uh, at one it named bump bump mm -hmm. plus and plus minus it's incremental and decremental mm -hmm. and uh, so you can program a full Turing machine mm -hmm. and you think the game is, is uh, still fun it's, it's not some like learning game for computer science students where it's a little bit both um, mm -hmm. for children it's um, funny to um, the graphical style and the um, something to do and you can learn to program mm -hmm. because uh, they have um, blocks like in scratch mm -hmm. and you um, drag and drop it on uh, a list mm -hmm. so um, you can jump at um, in this list and there are uh, it's possible to uh, drag and drop comments that's uh, really uh, important because um, if you program a complex program, you have to make comments mm. later. So you can't so you understand. So actual good important programming habits. Um, habits. Yeah, <laughs> like an assembler, okay, okay. but uh, not like yeah. a functional or yeah. objective. Do you think this game is more fun than going to a assembler tutorial to learn assembler? Yeah, it's um, nicer than yeah. a sampler, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, funny for children and uh, easy to learn because it's uh, you you haven't the full um, uh, functionality of this language um, mm -hmm. at the first. You have only um, so you restricted, have restricted code side, so you yeah. go step by step. Right? And um, the the. Um, uh, what you have to do is n at the first really uh, really easy later it would be uh, more complicated mm -hmm. complex. Uh, more complex mm -hmm. and there are some um, um, motiva motivations, motivations um, because they have uh, optimization um, steps mm -hmm. so you um, so you save time if you have a more clever command. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you're motivated to get it. Can, uh, uh, yes. Um, they have um, a minimum of um, steps mm -hmm. in your list, and they um, have steps uh, minimum to do each step. Mm -hmm. So um, they count the list and they count the uh, steps mm -hmm. uh, the human has done. Mm -hmm. And if it's the smallest uh, possible mm -hmm. way... So if you, you program have effective, you get yeah. uh, some reward. You, yes. Cool, cool. On, I will buy it today mm -hmm. and um, I will re uh, report in okay. another I'm podcast. I must say that there are a lot of learning game or three learning sites outside who teach the basic of procedural mm -hmm. programming with some kind of game like yeah. uh, robot to, uh, to a maze and, and mm -hmm. loops and conditionals. But yeah. This sounds more, more hardcore to assembler. Yeah. Say how it works out. At the homepage, you can find uh, some tutorials to other assembler um, mm -hmm. languages mm -hmm. because they have uh, described uh, his mm -hmm. steps and um, what. Um, they have uh, want to so yeah. you can read um, uh, like a machine works yeah. as cool. CPU yeah. so hopefully this will inspire some kids to uh, yeah. interact with assembler and I hope language. can you again say the website uh, where you get the game? tomorrow corporation tomorrow corporation dot com I think it's dot uh, com okay. it will be in the show notes. Well, uh, Stefan, you were scribbling, you have some uh, remarks? Meanwhile, even two more things came uh -huh. to my mind. I'm not so sure if it's a good idea if I get into this. 
One is, I don't remember the name of that game, so I have to look it up and then we put yeah. it in the show notes. <laughs> it's a game for learning JavaScript. Oh. Uh, it's an online game, so you don't, yeah. you don't have to Just install. Runs with your web browser. Runs with your web browser. Don't have, and the task is quite a funny one. It's one I've been thinking before a lot and still didn't yeah. come to proper solutions. The task is that you have to program an elevator. Ah, ah, like in the sim, in what, there was one sim ga, uh, game uh, yeah. right in the, back yeah. in the 90s. But here you get yeah. a DSL, so a domain-specific yeah. language, what you can do with that elevator, mm -hmm. and depending on conditions, <laughs> you can program it, and you get several tasks. For example, in the beginning, there are, I think, only two floors, and then it's quite easy. You just go up, and mm -hmm. then go down, and make a loop, and then every request yeah. will be uh, fulfilled ah, automatically. Yeah. I think I actually played that. It's but but yeah, then it gets it harder and harder, yeah, yeah. and I think yeah, on level yeah, yeah. three, it was not just doing it by writing it down. So yeah, I, yeah, you must make loops and conditions. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and people are arriving, and your yeah, task is and a certain you see amount that of actually on the yeah. on the browser. You see the Absolutely. people going and yeah. waiting for the elevator. Yeah, and then you can the, change the program yeah. and try another one, now mm. another try another iteration if you mm. can manage to to fulfill the task. For yeah. example, getting fifty people to yeah, the yeah, target yeah. floor. I, so I the people yeah. have a certain target. I, I think we had that in some issue of Beer Talker podcast in German language already. That described. could be. That and could I, be. I played it once. Yeah. And yeah, it, it was yeah. nice. It was yeah. for me, me a bit not uh, so for, for little um, kids appealing, but more for hardcore programmers. So and they, they want to go into JavaScript. It, I just feel, when you described the game, I just realized at the end you were describing Assembler, actually. Mm -hmm. So I will, uh, one more thing, one more talk came into my mind that I saw at Uruku last uh, week. There is quite an intense community forming around Commodore 64 again. Yeah. That's quite funny. Burn again, we, we that were yeah. born in the seventies. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And the, <laughs> the funny thing, if 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 you look at the numbers of how many games are actually published during the history, mm -hmm. it's been never more than 2014. So ah. it's still increasing, even that you can't buy that machine so anymore. Actually, people are now publishing games Absolutely. for the Commodore 64 that can. That, to, that is even never produced. So yeah. You can only buy old machines or you, emulators. You can, uh, sometimes you can uh, get a chance to buy new ones. The biggest problem is that the processors are not produced anymore. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if they can get uh, um, some old chips, like the processors, the main processors, or mm -hmm. the, the, um, so the C uh, CPUs mm -hmm. or the GPUs, there was an extra yeah. graphics chip on that and an extra audio chip on that, then you can buy... Uh, new uh, main boards and you can buy new cases for them that can be done and there is quite a big community forming around that with with new websites and stuff and um, also an interesting approach is how to circumvent the issue that you cannot get a new machine it's yeah. quite easy and most uh, with an emulator yeah, yeah. Okay. so yeah. machines but, are yeah. currently so fast that on a proper yeah. smartphone you can just download an emulator and run games and on have, that one. Uh, with your smartphone, you have the uh, Commodore 64 experience because the emulator is still fast enough. Way, way. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It's, okay. it's, yeah. It's, so I was not aware of that. It's yeah, yeah. Actually pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And you can, there are, meanwhile, there are nice, in, in former days, it was a mess to do uh, mm -hmm. an assembler program. There yeah. were no proper editors, all mm -hmm. that stuff. But now you program that on your PC or yeah, Mac or whatever a with a full IDE, which mm -hmm. gives you code completion and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And you have the internet open on a second window mm -hmm. and look up mm -hmm. the main pages there. Mm -hmm. And then you can do yeah, so you way can more effective. Like you never could do back in the 80s. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. And uh, you compile on your machine, yeah. which is way faster than the actual and, hardware. And you think these are all uh, so old guys in their 40s and 50s uh, that uh, re revive their children dreams also their dreams so of their childhood the to have these perfect Commodore 64 games they had not as a child themselves or are there, are there other motivations we, we, we also asked the presenter of the yeah, talk at yeah. Yuruku and he thinks it's more or less two groups mm -hmm. one is more or less what yeah, you yeah. described the old guys which are sometimes a bit hard to approach mm -hmm. because it's not they, they seem to have the feeling that it's not fair that you can go now the easy route you should yeah, go through yeah, all yeah, the troubles yeah, again yeah, as yeah. they had to do yeah, when yeah, they were learning all that mm -hmm. stuff 
but there is also quite a big group of, of younger mm -hmm. people forming and mm -hmm. uh, who really build up uh, communities, smaller communities online and exchange their knowledge, put up tutorials, blog posts, as it's done now with any community. But, but where get the, the cool factor of uh, Commodore 64? I mean, it was but, something their parents used. And, ah, yeah, and, but... Uh, compared with all these uh, gizmos that are out there, it must be extremely uncool and... and Like having an um, um, old timer. Y yes and no. Um, uh, you have in mind that there are lots of restrictions there, and mm -hmm. lots of these restrictions can be circumvented by being mm -hmm. clever. Yeah. So it's you have to prove yourself that okay. you can get around these restrictions. If you remember the demos from yeah, earlier yeah, times, yeah, where, where there is the demo scene? there is yeah, also yeah. quite a big uh, demo scene, uh, scene right now, for, and forming again and it's getting again bigger, demos. and also the number of demos wow, which wow. are published yeah. are. Uh, uh, growing and also the material that is public on the internet mm. it's, it's getting yeah. more and more so for example I've seen demos now with 3D, 3D graphics with mm -hmm. shaders and even I don't know how you would call that you see a stick figure, a 3D stick figure animated so they, mm. they do break dance, mm. uh, dancing and that stuff that yeah. was not And this all with uh, 64 KB one. Yes. Even not fully yes. And, and one gigahertz processor and, and not this not Uh, one one megahertz processor. <laughs> one megahertz processor. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and I think part of it too is that you mentioned the word restrictions. And so with the Commodore 64, there are very specific limitations. And I think that's a huge appeal because when you're developing for all different platforms mm -hmm. and all different browsers and, mm -hmm. and deciding between going for a console or, mm -hmm. or going for a PC, I think... There's a lot of there's a lot that we enjoy. So it's not just the older people that had Commodore 64s, but if we develop something new and cool and retro, it's like an old car now or an old radio or an old piece of furniture. I think and and the 64 was the most it it's the best-selling computer of all time. It was it was in the market for so long that it it has this sort of mythic Thing. And I, I get excited selfishly because I'm writing a novel that takes place in the near future, but about a young girl whose mother gives her Commodore 64 because she doesn't know that it, how old a computer it is. She just finds it in a, in a thrift shop. Um, but that girl is able to do so much more with her Commodore than her peers can do with their closed computers. So I, I think there's a real appeal to something that you can, that's easy to hack yeah. and code. Yeah. And, What what was also so appealing about these machines is when you switch them on, you could immediately start writing code, which cannot be done with the current machines. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a basic you interpreter. Have Microsoft basic <laughs> interpreter right from the start. It's not Microsoft. Yeah, it's, Microsoft. It was. It was Microsoft. Okay, so you had you had uh, we a all basic. We by Microsoft. Yeah. That's why we all use Windows later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And um, also, what is appealing um, that the assembler is quite easy to learn compa mm. compared to current processors because it has less way features, uh, um, uh, way less features. It was simpler. And it was a lot simpler. Yeah. It's only uh, uh, 8-bit machine. Yeah. yeah, 8-bit machine with 16-bit registers. If I it's remember. a Cisco or a RISC processor? No, it was not RISC. It was Z80 processor. Oh, I don't But remember that. Just linked to the yeah. Wikipedia page. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Tons of yeah, yeah. And uh, what, what's also quite funny if you learn that assembler machine that you're then not only capable of um, programming uh, Commodore 64 because that all was also the processor was also used in different machines. Yeah. For example, in the first Nint Nintendo game engine. So if you can. Hmm. Program that one, then you can also program for the uh, other devices, which are also now available as em as emulators, yeah. which is quite nice. And and to go back in memory lane, back to the 80s, yeah. if you wanted a decent game on the Commodore 64, you had to program it in assembler, assembler. because yeah. with all the high level language that yeah. existed, you could download yeah. Pascal for for a Commodore 64. You did not get the speed and. Uh, Mm. And so it, it was necessary to, to, to go yeah. into a sampler, learn a sampler, and you learned quite a bit programming on the hardcore level. And, and uh, interestingly enough, we, we then had also the connection to the Ruby, uh, which mm -hmm. was the, the conference was actually about. So Ruby is currently ha in heavy discussions how to deal with the pro problem of concurrency. And then more as a joke, but not so mm -hmm. much as a joke, 
the concurrency pro uh, problem was more or less solved with Commodore 64 because they in had the interrupts then. So that could even be a, 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 a pattern that could be mapped to modern programming languages again. Oh. Yeah. You're running out of batteries? Are you yeah, fine? Yeah, let's stop now. Okay. You're still listening to <laughs> uh, International <laughs> Open Podcast Issue 1. We had a little battery change break and Dennis managed to remove the card, <laughs> uh, SD card of the microphone. So if my voice is still shocking and vibrating from horror, that's because of Dennis' jo uh -huh. jokes. But everybody knows uh, that, that I have, uh, I knew that I have removed the SD card. And because I have a trusty personality and cannot read faces, I <laughs> did not even suspect it. Also. Well, uh, well, and now I get scolded because I don't know what 21 October 2015 is f for. What is this date for? Yeah, um, you no know idea. Back to the Future? Ah, this is the day that was referenced yeah. in Back to the Future 1. Yeah, it's, it will be tomorrow uh, for us, oh, not for okay. you. Um, yeah. We have the 20, 10, 15 and tomorrow... Um, the um, time machine okay. will arrive. And a young, uh, how is the actor called? J. Fox? Michael, Michael J. J. Fox. Michael J. Fox. Will yeah. go out and ask for this mm -hmm. uh, weird professor. Weird professor. But, yeah. but he won't find hoverboards. So that's a big impact mm -hmm. on current Actually, history. There yeah. are hoverboards. Yeah. I've seen you. There videos. are some. Were, yeah, and uh, 20th Century Fox uh, produced uh, um, uh, advertise uh, for hoverboards. So mm -hmm. they have um, some advertising yeah. for it. Uh, Pepsi has an own um, bottle f for this day because um, uh, in Back to Future 2. Uh, there are used some Pepsi bottles okay. and these um, Pepsi had produced now mm -hmm. um, and some other things will There should happen. be those Levi's jeans. I remember there were jeans ah. that would reshape to yeah, the body yeah, yeah. And, 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 and the shoes, the shoes Nikes. Nikes. And now I have to bring in Austrian Ministry of Transportation. There is an actual connection to the to the date because today they brought out traffic regulation for hoverboards. Ah. <laughs> Not kidding you. You can find it up on the website. Mm -hmm. ah, okay, okay. And if you have time um, um, at this day, there are some triple features in some cinemas. Also, so you can watch all three Back to the Future movies in binge yeah. watching mode. Yeah. Uh, uh, worldwide. I heard in Germany and Austria it will uh, be provided, I think, in America too. And I think um, everybody, uh, tomorrow all streets are very empty and everybody <laughs> <laughs> is in the cinema. cinema. Yeah. Okay. And we'll hear Johnny Be Good on every radio station. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, okay. We have still a big topic. Yeah. Uh, Make a fair Rome. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to quickly add that I had my first experience with Mickey Mickey, that uh, yeah. famous author of uh, Scratch for Dummies computer book gifted to me. Uh, the author's name is Derek Breen, and we are here very open for inside advertisement if you like the people. And yeah, um, I. Yesterday, um, with a student of mine, um, I ran the computer courses in Vienna, the afternoon computer course school, and I used um, Makey Makey with a nine year old, I think he was nine year old, and it was very fun. He was easy to entertain, so if, if he's with some older guys and they do something in Scratch, he, he cannot stop la laughing. I really did not get what, what you find funny, but you find nearly everything Bananas. funny, but then it was like, like he had um, that's uh, a never-ending joy button if we connected Makey Makey to... I don't even know where I connected it. So it's a little board and you connect it with, to the USB of your computer and it can emulate a click of a mouse and some keys like space keys and arrow keys. Mm -hmm. And you have um, wires with um, connection... Alligator clips. Alligator, alligator clips. Yeah. And you have one um, grounding mm -hmm. and and other clips to match the key. And the idea is you can then use your body or parts of body or, or fluids or something as keys or mouse clips for 
to control games or so, whatever. So it's not uh, uh, dangerous for kids playing with it because no, it's low no. low voltage yeah, yeah. and yeah. low currencies yeah, yeah. and yeah, so on. Exactly, yes. And you don't need to solder any anything. You don't you need to solder. Just you only need to operate these allocator chips. Sounds nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, one side of the board is set up like a very simple Nintendo <laughs> game controller yeah. with up, down, left, right, and, and, and a few buttons. The other side is more like a traditional keyboard, so you clip in different areas to control scratch or control a video game. That one of my favorites is using pep slices of pepperoni pizza to control a PowerPoint <laughs> presentation. So left and right slices of pizza. Um, it, so it's a very playful thing. They say it's an invention kit for everyone, and it turns everyday objects into ways to control your computer. So using water or or being able to create your own game controller so that you have to jump up and down like on a trampoline to jump in Mario land or some kind of platform game. Like it's really, it, it, in, it invites creativity I think in a really cool way and doing it in the real world instead of just on the computer. It also invites tinkering, at least my box, because there was no instruction whatsoever inside. Yeah. So I think this is by design, or yeah. I don't know if someone removed the instruction, so you really have to figure it out yourself. It's not hard. I have experience with the Makey Makey 2. Uh, last podcast, <laughs> this is the first, but I talk about the last. <laughs> um, so it must be Bierdorfer Podcast 226. Uh, I talked about a game I programmed with um, MIDI, mm -hmm. and um, we used Makey Makeys as um, in, uh, inputs too. Mm -hmm. We had a letter. Um, a book um, you have to um, aufschlagen and turn the pages. Yeah, turn the pages to um, con uh, to uh, make a contact. Ah, okay. So you used a book as a switch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, some uh, a triangle, um, a triangle. Uh -huh. Music instrument. Yeah, yeah. Um, and something else I don't remember. And mm -hmm. this are um, for playing um, something like Pong, mm -hmm. but it it was a uh, music game, mm -hmm. and uh, you have uh, two pedals. Um, mm -hmm. The player one has one pedal, the other has mm -hmm. the other, and you can control with these panels. And. Um, uh, Yeah, we used Makey Makeys for that. Mm. And it works good. Yeah, mm. we tried uh, bananas. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we thought about to use um, uh, pudding. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> because it w were really funny if you have to put the thing <laughs> Go in the... Coconut in the pudding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it works really easy. Well, I can also report that the nine-year-old who was my student had endless fun. If I if I touch his nose, we, we set it up with Scratch that if the space key is pressed, the sound emits. Yes, so when I touched his nose, and the computer made a noise. <laughs> it was unstoppable. It's one of the first things I always do with kids. Uh, the the creators of Makey Makey, it was Jay Silver and Eric Rosenbaum. Uh, it's also Eric Rosenbaum. Yeah. Eric so the, we we mentioned Eric Rosenbaum in another podcast because he created a way to do 3D in Scratch. So Jay and Eric were both part of the lifelong kindergarten group at MIT. They both got their PhDs last year, but they were still students and they raised the money to manufacture Makey Makeys by doing a Kickstarter campaign. So it was crowdsourced, which is great. And they even donated several Makey Makeys for me to bring to Africa for Africa Code Week. Also, so, I get um, indirectly my Makey Makey direct from Eric Rosenbaum. Yeah, indirectly, oh, indirectly. But I'm famous. Yeah, uh, so I was able to leave four of them in Africa at two different schools. And so I have a bunch of students working on projects that they're going to report back as a way to have continuity yeah. after Africa Code Week. Cool. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, there's... There's a fantastic, um, we'll link to a TED talk by Jay Silver about the why he wanted to create Makey Makey. He was partially inspired by a trip to a third world country, I think in South America, where he was really impressed at the way that kids could make all sorts of things out of just 
grass and leaves and things that they found in the jungle and he wondered if there was a way to bring that to first world kids and and makey makey was was a response to that so it's really cool so actually bring nature back to white yeah kids too much for the computer yeah wooden keys yeah, ah, I remember three years ago on the Linux Weeks in Vienna, um, there was a presentation from the Firefox um, uh, guy. Yeah. Uh, he pre uh, um, he demonstrated um, Unreal Tournament in the browser. Oh. Uh, that, oh. That's the topic, but um, the, uh, he has used a makey-makey for that. <laughs> ah. And bananas, yeah. of course. You can yeah. play Android tournament with bananas. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not impossible to uh, uh, to take the banana and shoot with bananas to something. <laughs> not yet. Ah. Not yet. <laughs> oh, cool. But that's so much of what I like about it, is that it uses real-world objects that that people can find. Like at the Scratch conference last summer, people were doing musical instruments out of rubbish from a Starbucks cafe, cups and, and aluminum and all that stuff. And, and so I think it really, it gets at a new level of creativity. I think it's cool. Yeah. How does such a device appear for Scratch? Is it a game controller for Scratch yeah. then? Yeah, game controller. Also, they're very popular with DJs in New York uh, yeah. who are making their own custom controllers for MIDI. Oh, yeah. um, and if you see the TED Talk, one of the most heartwarming moments is a father who has a son, I think, with cerebral palsy mm -hmm. or some other disease, so his son can't move his body very well. And his father can create a custom keyboard based on the movement that his son has. So it's really enabling people to do engineering that might not otherwise be able to control a computer. And it doesn't require any drivers. It's just plug and play with PC, Mac, and Linux. It's just a, like any keyboard. It's a normal keyboard uh, via a USB and yes. um, mouse, uh, mouse. a mouse. Yeah. But it's limited to, I think, 16 uh, keys. It's not possible to emulate no. the whole keyboard yeah. with Uh, over 100 keys and um, the funny thing is uh, on this uh, makey makey there's Arduino CPU so you can use it as uh, uh, Arduino. Is Arduino inbuilt in the makey makey? Yeah on the board is I think that's Arduino. right I, I think they built it from yeah. the same board I think yeah. it's so not an Arduino but it's co uh, totally compatible oh, okay, to okay. Yeah. Arduino yeah. it's the same cool. chip yeah. so you can program your own mm. programs And you can do things like a theremin because it lets you control the mouse mm -hmm. position and it even has acceleration. Yeah. So if you, if it's mouse up, it gradually accelerates just like a mouse would or a trackpad. It's really very thoughtful. They also, they have a, there's another product they gave me one to bring to Africa called Dradio, which they did together and it lets you have this little circuit with a speaker on a paintbrush or a pencil and then water or paint or pencil lead becomes the medium for doing like a theremin that you can have basic sound so you can you can sort of paint with sound yeah uh, which is something that Eric Rosenbaum's been exploring with touch based interfaces with iPad apps so we I don't know if you saw his demo but he does yeah Yeah, so Singing Fingers is the app that we did in another uh, podcast, and he also has a thing called Melody Morph that really explores the way that you can create nonlinear music, so a way for children to create music with their voices and their fingers and and um, this concept of, uh, what's it called when you cross the different senses together, like touch and feel and uh, touch and... Yeah, more like... Um, There's a word where you your senses get sort of crossed, where you taste colors. Ah, and, um, uh, synesthesia yeah, yeah. or synesthetics, this idea of um, crossing different senses. Yeah. Another short one? 
another short one. Yes. Topic? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah because yeah. You, you inspired me with uh, <laughs> bringing paint and um, sound together. I was listening also at Euroku to a talk by uh, Joseph Wilk. I uh, learned about this guy when I met him in Berlin three years ago, where he was talking about the use of language at programming, how we sometimes misuse it. Mm -hmm. So, and he was comparing to language usage in literature, which was also quite interesting. So that talk was very inspiring. And now three years later, I met him again in Salzburg and I was expecting something about literature again, but now he switched completely his, his area where he's working. He's, more or less, I would say, an artist and not so much a coder anymore. Uh, he's doing actual performances with Sonic Pies, which are also in used, uh, are used in school for mm -hmm. teaching about programming, teaching about music and all that stuff together. And uh, he uses it, it for actual performances, um, which contain, of course, of sound. So he also gave a live performance at that audience in Salzburg. It was in a quite big hall there uh, with 600 attendees and, and the lit lights were dimmed down. And this was incredible to, to hear really that small sonic pie filling up the whole, whole conference hall. And not only did he uh, provide us with, with incredible sound, but also with animations. There are um, libraries which can quite easily be included into uh, Sonic Pi programs. And there is meanwhile, when I was looking into Sonic Pi a few years ago, and looked for me it looked not very approachable and not very appealing. And, and that has so much progressed. So the, it, the code was quite easily readable. I didn't uh, know it before. I just was looking on the screen where it was projected. And as the background of the screen, he used animations and gave, gave this, this presentation that was really awesome. You could hear if, if somebody would have uh, dropped his or her pen in the... And it was absolutely quiet in that room besides the sounds he was producing with it. And in the beginning, it, it seemed to be quite easy because he started from scratch with the program. So it just was uh, some simple noises. But in the end, it was uh, something like you have maybe heard or seen from, from VJs, from video DJs. Yeah, it was a full performance, full professional, and all done in real time with programming. He just created, so created on the fly. On the fly. Yeah, pre -pre no, nothing prescripted. Yeah. He just was, you, you could see in his face when he was pleased with something. And for every now and then, that, that Sonic Pi is also quite uh, clever, so it catches errors. Ah. So every now and then you do mistype when you do, mm -hmm. especially when you are. So it's an error correction in. in yeah, you, yeah. It, it doesn't crash, but yeah. it gives you an error message mm -hmm. and tries to help you a little mm -hmm. bit how you can figure out. And uh, afterwards, I, I talked a little bit to him and he told, he told me. Because I was asking him as well if he did preparations and he said, of course, he knows his stuff more or less, mm -hmm. but still it's always a bit of experimenting with, with the numbers and the filters and the instruments and all that, all that. And at one certain uh, uh, point in time, he just mistyped and something came out that he wasn't expecting. Mm -hmm. So he was a little bit shocked because he was expecting something completely mm -hmm. different. But so it was live. Yeah. And while he was shocked about it, he, he started to like it. So mm -hmm. he thought, well, why not let's let it in and build it in and then it, that changed his further performance so that was really ni nice to see that and you could theoretically repeat all that with just sonic pi and some plugins it was actually sonic yeah. pi so yeah. absolutely good, good motivation to look yeah. into sonic yeah. pi and and um he he, he does this we asked him how much training does he have and he told us he does this now for more than two years and almost every day so just trying to get better and his locks you you can lock sonic pi input and his logs are um, uh, captured and he publishes them on the internet. So you are yeah, able, you able to, yeah, you can download them yeah. and learn from in him how he's, he's approaching the stuff. So that's, cool, cool. that was really the, the most artistic mm -hmm. uh, stuff I've ever seen at a programming conference. Yeah. But that was art, that was not programming. And this for guy me. makes money out of his. Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, sure. Just, just I'm not sure. But it's also cool that it's programming as performance. Yeah. That the programming is part of the yeah. performance. Yeah. Like that's really cool. Yeah. yeah.
if you like improvisation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, this is yeah, yeah. And, and it's almost shocking when you see him the first uh, time. He's he has to be in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. so he comes quite small onto that stage, and suddenly he rocks it by programming. Okay. 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 Some of us have finished eating, <laughs> while others um, will take a longer time eating. So we continue. Uh, the International Open Podcast, and we have one topic left, and this is uh, that Derek and me uh, were together on our first road trip to make a fair Rome in Italy. Roma! Derek, you like it? Oh, it was wonderful. I don't think either of us expected it to be so huge. The scale of it was really overwhelming, um, but so worth traveling and meeting people from not just Rome or even Italy, but all over the world that were there, don't you think? Yeah, it, it was one of the uh, biggest uh, maker fairs in Europe, so I heard. There is another big maker fair in Germany, Hanover. Uh, I cannot give exact dates because I never was there. But what we hear from the participants in Rome alone and from the people um, who had tables there, uh, they said it, it, it was it's one of the biggest in Europe. And and next year it should come to Austria as well, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, we will have a little make a fair uh, Vienna. I suppose this is small at the beginning and will maybe grow larger. So how was your experience at the make a fair? Yeah, well, um, to give a bit of uh, a description, uh, I have not yet the exact dates. Maybe you can sh read them in the show notes at uh, internationalopenmagazine.org. Um, the the wool uh, maker fair happened in a university district. It's not a university building. It was a wool district with several houses, gardens, and even their own church. Uh, this district was called uh, Sapienza. Sapienza. Sapienza is one of the oldest university districts of Rome. And basically from Friday till Sunday it was occupied by makers and um, they closed most of the buildings but and instead of buildings they made in the free space of this uh, university district, there, there were large parks inside, uh, they put on big tents um, and inside the tents there were small tables for each uh, exhibitor and so one tent had typically I think uh, between 50 and 100 tables Each table were manned by two or three persons presenting their project with, uh, with um, signs and uh, putting their hardware projects mostly on the table. And um, the crowd uh, could go through these tents. The tents were usually very uh, long rectangles. So you, you go through in, in both directions. And there were about, I think, two dozen tents at least. Yeah, and the tents were organized on certain themes. So mm -hmm. projects were grouped together, like on energy or transportation Textile, or yeah, fab three D fabrication, yeah. like um, yeah. When I think about a maker fair, I always think about three D printers. Yeah, oh, yeah. So maybe can you give some other examples what you have seen there? Of the not three D printers. Of the not three D yeah. printers. I must add that we have seen a lot of three D printers <laughs> yeah. and a lot of three D printed stuff. Yes, one of the other examples, well, there were textiles, there were um, steampunk uh, players, mm. there was a drone flying area, so a giant uh, cube with nets so that the drones could not escape, and people made um, art, art uh, like art flying courses, so, so they tried to fly their drones through hoops. And yeah. hoops and so Then was, what was there? There were a lot of music. So music was the yeah thing. musical instruments. We saw an incredible device that played an acoustic guitar. So they built this machine that would play any music. It it made any guitar into like a music box. They would feed music into it, and then it would pluck with some devices and also finger with with different um, controllers like servo systems. And uh, do you have to expect that uh, people try to st sell stuff to you, or is it some? Not? Yeah, <laughs> some sold. But uh, as we learned, uh, if you did not sell something, if you had just an information table about your project, you get the table for free. Ah, cool. So there were things like uh, Internet of Things Zurich, who was a guy who just presented his stuff. 
-hmm. And he did uh, by uh, by intentional did not wanted to sell them. He said the plans are online. You can download it yourself and build it yourself. So it was such and such. So there were commercial projects. There were much most projects who were students projects or young entrepreneur projects who hope to become an enterprise and, and sh uh, show their. Their, their products, mm -hmm. and there were some intentional open source, open hardware project who had not even uh, commercial interest, and a lot of mixed too, of course. And some of the big companies were there, like IBM and Microsoft, mm -hmm. and they had their booths, they tried to make them creative, so it wasn't just like promoting the office suite or something. Microsoft developed this huge keyboard that a bunch of people could play on the floor, like from the movie Big, where they would step on the different keys. And it was set up to play Beethoven's Ninth, like the Ode to Joy, without needing to know the music or anything. Um, but it was, it was mostly people showing off their own projects. That's what I liked about it. They were really there was a lot of creativity, a lot and of diversity in yeah, well. and collaboration, and also inspiring each other. And then there were a few huge tents dedicated just for children to tinker with things. Um, I participated in some scratch workshops. There were robotics and even more like artsy, arts and crafts type thing. So it was it, tons of families going through like. So yeah. children are also allowed to come in and, and yeah. play with the stuff. Actually, you had to pay entrance. I did not exactly know if uh, children uh, under a certain age were free. But there were a lot of family with a lot of children. There. So it was really a popular if, event. If you were allowed to take three. Uh, items with you oh. from that maker ah. fair. Well, that's What's easy. I would have taken the three robots of the heavy metal band. <laughs> There was a really heavy metal band consisting of heavy metal robot made out of chunks, a metal chunk, and they were performing. Uh, so that they made a huge um, stage where these robots were with the heavy metal uh, guitar and uh, drums, and then a um, performist who had a yeah. very punk fucked up. Remote control and uh, controlled this robot, and it was a mixture of, of hard rock music and and, and steam uh, steam robot cyber thing performance and, and rock band. Uh, I think I, I wanted them just for me, uh, so <laughs> to scare to, ah. to scare the shit out of people because they were very impressive and very big, so larger than humans, and very intimidating looking. I would have taken. There was a bamboo bicycle. So the whole frame was made out of bamboo. And then there was a skateboard made out of grass or hay or something that was really interesting. And then I really wanted this Airstream trailer that had been converted into a children's coding laboratory, like a portable laboratory. That I, I took more pictures of that one Airstream trailer than anything else at the Maker Fair. I think it was so cool that the whole side opened up and invited kids in to try out different things. It was really cool. Uh, you find all our pictures on Flickr and we will also link it on the show notes. The hashtag yeah. of the whole event was um, hash, uh, MakerFairRoma.org. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, can, you can find it there. And did it trigger some new projects maybe for you? New project for us? Well, um, I learned that you can have a free table there, so I want to be there next time, especially with my friends from Internet of Things Austria and Internet of Things Vienna. And, well, there were a lot, huge of diversity of projects. There were um, fish tank controls with Arduino. There were Arduino uh, successor projects who, with integrated uh, website and sharing repository. Um, it was actually so much projects that I was uh, not go visiting all the tents because some were so stuffed with uh, with romance uh, people that this was too full for me. There were uh, tents dedicated to rockets, tents dedicated to drones, tents dedicated to music, tents dedicated to uh, student projects, tents dedicated to uh, 3D printing, to 3D stamping, uh, one only for textiles. Yeah. For a fashion. So there, you, if you had any interest at all in making something yourself, you would have fa found a tent with, with um, groups specialized in this area. I was naturally more um, interested in the open source project, so just, I will just uh, speak about some that I remember mostly. One was a very nice student and he made his own remote one-way drone 
so like a toy, a big toy um, airplane, and it could deliver a non-military payload up to two kilogram, 100 kilometer for 100 euro, something like that with the specs. And I said, well, you you enjoy, uh, you created the first do-it-yourself cruise missile for terrorists. And he said, no, no, it's non-military. <laughs> You can no, no, use no, no, any technology yeah, for yeah, good of, and for bad. Of course, so. yes. Mm. Then another thing, I, I really was deeply impressed, they cooperated with British uh, Space Society uh, something. They made an open source um, space uh, simulator for the Soyuz aircraft, for the Russian aircraft. Mm. And the, the simulator could train you with two joysticks to learn the docking maneuver if you want to dock a Soyuz spaceship to the International Space uh, Station. So that was uh, very cool, I think. And well, there were a lot other cool, uh, cool stuff. On Hungary, I made an, a switch table, so a table that you can use while you stand and while you sit. Mm -hmm. It had uh, some counterweights, so with a pull you could. A standing desk out yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's just a beautiful design. So not, yeah. And uh, yeah, a lot of little projects, big projects, all kind of projects. I was really impressed by the way that a bunch of different coder dojos came together. So there was a coder dojo area and they had different workshops for children that could just show up and, and try out robotics and a little bit of programming and a little bit of design. Um, so that's, that's something that if I went back, I'd love to do more preparation for having more spaces where kids could explore things together. And, and Horst made a great friend who was doing Minecraft modding stuff using um, running on Raspberry Pis. And there was a ton of people have developed all different Raspberry Pi accessories, different like touch screens for Raspberry Pi and displays and input devices and boxes. And so it really seems like people are embracing the open architecture of things like Raspberry Pi and Arduino. Also, you must keep in mind that Arduino is in part of an Italian project. It was built by Italian uh, students, I think, the makers. And so they showed their, of their literature. There was a whole shop for Arduino uh, books. And, and they showed off this uh, successor projects of Arduino. Mm -hmm. And there were some really cool, cool stuff, especially if you are interested in education with, with tech. Yeah, I will try to write a blog post about our things. Uh, at the moment, uh, um, while we record this podcast, only the pictures are online. I, I may add something that I noticed uh, as an Austrian visiting Italy. And um, while it, I think it was incredibly peaceful if you keep in mind how many people were there in such a concentrated area. But there were some uh, strange things like um, uh, police come up with riot uh, cars with water cannons. Uh, at the same time as the, a lot of school buses were loading off their school children with teachers. And, and then later we learned that some students were protesting that the uh, university area was closed off for the maker fair and they still had to go to the building and they were protesting. So there was some mix of, And what I personally disliked the most was the lack of toilets. They had some. How you call them? Uh, porta potties. Porta potties, but not every porta potty was located near um, public fountain. So sometimes people come out of the porta potties and could not wash their hands at all. And um, then of of all the buildings, only three were open. One of them, only two had an inbuilt toilet, like we know them. So not the one toilet that was in a public uh, restaurant, there was a very long uh, queue of people and the other was um, lucky wise very hidden. So I managed to find them, but I spent a half day just systematically <laughs> searching for toilets because I, yeah, uh, I had a long train travel. I wanted a, a good toilet. <laughs> it's a bit and, also, and, and also it didn't seem like there were many food options. There were so many people and so few places to get food. They had food stalls, but they're not yeah, there were, there were long, a few, long a few yeah. for tens of thousands of people. But it, it seems like that, that could have been tied into the maker yeah. sense a little bit more that maybe there'd or be food, some food, food like some interesting ways to prepare food or or um, organic. Yeah. On the other hand, I philosoph 
I think about this topic while I was there, and I think most of the Roman families they come there with their little childs and Romans and uh, uh, and, and yes and, and parents are guarding the childs and so. And I think they were not spoiled like me that I go to a big event and expect a perfect toilets and perfect food opportunities. They may had um, organized something in advance like if I go spend one day on this uh, university area, I may pack some lunch or I may go with my noisy kids to the toilet first. I mean, they had maybe more more experience for even. So there was no no complaining. I have seen no, nobody complaining, which is incredible mm -hmm. by this amount of people. I have not the exact uh, numbers, but uh, I guess there were at least more than 50,000 people on this event, maybe double uh, to uh, three times the size. Because it was three, uh, three days and it, uh, even the uh, Friday uh, before noon was uh, reserved for schools. Mm -hmm. So it was public only after Friday afternoon. And then it was packed, packed with people. And peaceful people, I must really say. Peaceful, stylish Roman people. Yeah. yeah. With children, with uh, shoving their bodies with children through packed tents and all peaceful. So next year you're going to... I really want to again. have a table there, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. at least for uh, Internet of Things also. And um, yeah, maybe for my own company, I don't know. But it's if you have some project to show off, do it in Italy. It's and well, well worth a trip. And now you have to translate all your stuff to Italian? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. It, if you go to Italy, it's very good to have some translator, have at least some... Uh, some folder in Italian language that you can how to uh, hand out to the people. There were some um, people at tables who did not speak Italian and they also communicated it. It was not that big a deal. And also the organizers tried to um, announce everything in English and most of the project had uh, Italian and English uh, dual language, uh, at least dual language posters. Mm -hmm. So you could, even if you could not speak Italian, you could see what is it is about. But of course, in Italy, most of people speak Italian mostly and not very good English, if at all. That's, that, that's clear. I can, I can say on a, a personal light side, it's very easy to make Italian makers very happy. You just go around and speak with them English, which is funny enough. So, and then uh, you say, yes, um, I'm... I write for, or you just say I'm from out of Italy, yes, wherever, yes, and you say I want to write about that, and even if it's just a Facebook entry, and they get so happy, you don't, <laughs> you don't believe it, yes, so like uh, the first uh, that make them happy is that you come from so far, just sit their table, yes, <laughs> and then that you even want to write about them, and they want to make uh, selfies with you and so on. I really had a, a, a big joy of just making, going around and say, yeah, I will post about it in my international blog. And oh, <laughs> that made them really enormous happy. So it was well, well worth a trip for this feeling. Mm -hmm. Derek, uh, your, your thoughts. Uh, we ran again low on the batteries. So yeah. Uh, uh, bring, bring it on, bring it on. It, it, <laughs> it was, part of what was exciting is just to see that it, You don't have to be an American com company or in America to do really innovative things with electronics and computers. Um, so it, I, I think it, it had a. It was so great to be outside of the U.S. and and to be surrounded by these really innovative people from all over Europe, and it just reminded me that Americans don't own innovation. There's innovation all over the place. And I think also being in Italy, there was a sense of this historical connection to engineering innovations through the centuries. So every time I saw something with fabric or something with an engine or something with engineering, it made me think of the great Italian pioneers, like Da Vinci being the, the sort of poster child for innovation. Um, and even some of the ways that drones were designed, they look like beautiful Da Vinci drawings. I think style was a much bigger part than what we might see at other maker fairs because of the Italian um, emphasis and, and historical ties to design. So that was really cool. I must also add that we never have seen unstylish Roman people. They, they seem to be very stylish, all of them. So incredible. So even, even the nerds there were 
more stylish than normal people here, just <laughs> a bit less stylish than the uh-huh. <laughs> people visiting the, the tables. Yeah. Really seem to be uh, taking a lot of effort in fashion and good looking. Yeah, um, yeah, we also had too much fun in Rome. We were um, visiting a graveyard, <laughs> which oh. was huge. Um, it was near the near the university area, and we, we just uh, a bit too early and wanted to have peaceful lunch. And it was we had the whole graveyard for us nearly. Yeah, I mean it was a it was an entire town. It had built like skyscrapers and. It so was really incredible. Big monuments like little towers. No, not like the central. Um, no, Dreyfus you can fit the whole uh, Vienna Central Cemetery in a little patch of this. <laughs> and this had really mountains inside and hills and, and uh, gorges. With, this was really yeah, 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 going up stairway after stairway yeah. into areas. Like. And uh, the best thing for us, uh, so Bull, Bull Rome is populated by cats. They are <laughs> remarkably well fed. Maybe they, they hide the, the hungry cats. And uh, in the graveyards, we discovered, to our joy, we discovered parrots, so flying from tree to tree, green, green parrots. And this alone was very magical for us to, to go in a place and see white parrots. And somehow the, the trees are very high. We, we speculated that the parrots are too intelligent to be eaten by the cats or, mm-hmm. or too high up in the trees. But, uh, this was, was incredible. And we figured they must have been pets at one time that 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 the owners let go or they escaped and they just started creating these colonies no, they colonized yeah mm-hmm. well yeah we just can say um, visiting Roma Maker Fair is, uh, is very well but uh, trip oh yeah cool but if you go on the sleeper car between <laughs> yeah, Vienna okay. and Rome you want to make sure to have a nice padded bag as a as a headboard because it's very difficult to sleep against all the uneven hard surfaces of the train but we were very fortunate with our sleeper cars so i'm i'm grateful that we did the sleeper car thing we also learned while traveling from vienna uh, you can get a sparschine as a, a discounted ticket if you book in advance that's very good and uh, the best thing was uh, inside the sleeping car um, you get um, the, the crew uh, offer you hot food and meal and drinks and uh, some wagon offered drinks and food all the night yeah. and we get very cheap wine and beer for